it again until it does, because it is important. So really isn't a word that we should use with simple confidence. If a neutrino had a brain which had evolved in neutrino-sized ancestors, it would say that rocks really do consist of empty space. We have brains that evolved in medium-sized ancestors which couldn't walk through rocks. Really, for an animal, is whatever its brain needs it to be in order to assist its survival. And because different species live in different worlds, there will be a discomforting variety of realies. What we see of the real world is not the unvarnished world, but a model of the world, regulated and adjusted by sense data, but constructed so it's useful for dealing with the real world. The nature of the model depends on the kind of animal we are. A flying animal needs a different kind of model from a walking, climbing or swimming animal. A monkey's brain must have software capable of simulating a three-dimensional world of branches and trunks. A mole software for constructing models of its world will be customized for underground use. A water strider's brain doesn't need 3D software at all since it lives on the surface of the pond in an Edwin Abbott flatland. I've speculated that bats may see color with their ears. The world model that a bat needs in order to navigate through three dimensions catching insects must be pretty similar to the world model that any flying bird, a day flying bird like a swallow needs to perform the same kind of tasks. The fact that the bat uses echoes in pitch darkness to input the current variables to its model while the swallow uses light is incidental. Bats, I've even suggested, use perceived hues such as red and blue as labels, internal labels, for uh, some useful aspect of echoes, perhaps the acoustic texture of surfaces, furry or smooth and so on. In the same way as swallows, or indeed we, use those perceived hues, redness and blueness, etc., to label long and short wavelengths of light. There's nothing inherent about red that makes it long wavelength. And the point is that the nature of the model is governed by how it is to be used rather than by the sensory modality involved. J.B.S. Haldane himself had something to say about animals whose world is dominated by smell. Dogs can distinguish two very similar fatty acids, extremely diluted, caprylic acid and caproic acid. And the only difference you see is that one has an extra pair of carbon atoms in the chain. Haldane guesses that a dog would probably be able to place the acids in the order of their molecular weights by their smells, just as a man could place a number of piano wires in the order of their lengths by means of their notes. Now there's another fatty acid, capric acid, which is just like the other two, except that it has two more carbon atoms. A dog that had never met capric acid would perhaps have no more trouble imagining its smell then we would have trouble imagining a trumpet, say, playing one note higher than we've heard a trumpet play before. Perhaps dogs and rhinos and other smell-oriented animals smell in color, and the argument would be exactly the same as for the bats. Middle world, the range of sizes and speeds which we have evolved to feel intuitively comfortable with it's a bit like the narrow range of the electromagnetic spectrum that we see as light of various colors. We're blind to all frequencies outside that unless we use instruments to, to help us. Middle world is the narrow range of reality which we judge to be normal as opposed to the queerness of the very small, the very large, and the very fast. And we could make a similar scale of improbabilities. Nothing is totally impossible. Miracles are just events that are extremely improbable. A marble statue could wave its hand at us. The atoms that make up its crystalline structure are all vibrating back and forth anyway. Because there are so many of them, and because there's no agreement among them in their preferred direction of movement, the marble, as we see it in middle world, stays rock steady. But the atoms in the hand could all just happen to move the same way at the same time, and again and again. In this case, the hand would move and we'd see it waving at us in middle world. The odds against it, of course, are so great that if you set out writing zeros 
the time of the origin of the universe, you still would not have written enough zeros to this day. Evolution in middle world has not equipped us to handle very improbable events. We don't live long enough. In the vastness of astronomical space and geological time, that which seems impossible in middle world might turn out to be inevitable. One way to think about that is by counting planets. We don't know how many planets there are in the universe, but a good estimate is about 10 to the 20 or 100 billion billion. And that gives us a nice way to express our estimate of life's improbability. We could make some sort of landmark points along a spectrum of improbability, which might look like the electromagnetic spectrum we just uh, looked at. If life has arisen only once on any if, if, if life could, I mean, life could originate once per planet, it could be extremely common. Or it could originate once per star, or once per galaxy, or maybe only once in the entire universe, in which case it would have to be here. And somewhere up there would be the chance that a frog would turn into a prince and similar magical things like that. If life has arisen on, on only one planet in the entire universe, that planet has to be our planet, because here we are talking about it. And that means that if we want to avail ourselves of it, we're allowed to postulate chemical events in the origin of life which have a probability as low as one in a hundred billion billion. I don't think we shall have to avail ourselves of that because I suspect that life is quite common in the universe. But when I say quite common, it could still be so rare that no one island of life ever encounters another, which is a sad thought. How shall we interpret queerer than we can suppose. Queerer than can in principle be supposed, or just queerer than we can suppose, given the limitations of our brain's evolutionary apprenticeship in middle world. Could we, by training and practice, emancipate ourselves from middle world and achieve some sort of intuitive, as well as mathematical, understanding of the very small and the very large? I genuinely don't know the answer. I wonder whether we might help ourselves to understand, say, quantum theory, if we brought up children to play computer games beginning in early childhood, which had a sort of make-believe world of balls going through two slits on a screen, a world in which the strange goings-on of quantum mechanics were enlarged by the computer's make-believe so that they became familiar on the middle world scale of the screen. And similarly, a relativistic computer game in which objects on the screen manifest the Lorentz contraction and so on, um, the, to try to get ourselves into the way of thinking, get children into the way of thinking about it. I want to end by applying the idea of middle world to our perceptions of each other. Most scientists today subscribe to a mechanistic view of the mind, where the way we are, because our brains are wired up as they are, our hormones are the way they are. We'd be different, our characters would be different, if our neuroanatomy and our physiological chemistry were different. But we scientists are inconsistent. If we were consistent, our response to a misbehaving person like a child murderer should be something like, this unit has a faulty component, it needs repairing. And that's not what we say. What we say, and I include the most austerely mechanistic among us, which is probably me, what we say is, vile monster, prison is too good for you. Or worse, we seek revenge, in all probability, thereby triggering the next phase in an escalating cycle of counter-revenge which we see, of course, all over the world today. In short, when we're thinking like academics, we regard people as elaborate and complicated machines like computers or cars. But when we revert to being human, we behave more like Basil Fawlty. We remember thrashed his car to teach it a lesson when it wouldn't start on gourmet night. The reason we personify things like cars and computers is that just as monkeys live in an arboreal world and moles live in an underground world and water striders live in a surface tension-dominated flatland, we live in a social world. We swim through a sea of people, a social version of middle world. We are evolved to second-guess the behavior of others by becoming brilliant, intuitive psychologists. Treating people as machines may be scientifically and philosophically accurate, but it's a cumbersome waste of time if you want to guess what this person is going to do next. The economically useful way to model a person is to treat him as a purposeful, goal-seeking agent with pleasures and pains, desires and intentions, guilt, blameworthiness. 
Personification and the imputing of intentional purpose is such a brilliantly successful way to model humans, it's hardly surprising the same modeling software often seizes control when we're trying to think about entities for which it's not appropriate, like Basil Fawlty with his car, or like millions of deluded people with the universe as a whole. <laughs> if the universe is queerer than we can suppose, is it just because we've been naturally selected to suppose only what we needed to suppose in order to survive in the Pleistocene of Africa? Or are our brains so versatile and expandable that we can train ourselves to break out of the box of our evolution? Or finally, are there some things in the universe so queer that no philosophy of beings, however godlike, could dream them? Thank you very much. <laughs>